The bad news is the, the person that was slotted for the final presentation is unable to present. So for that, I apologize. Um, the good news is we'll get out of here a little sooner. The other bad news is you're going to be stuck hearing a few things that have been on my mind throughout this conference that I want to share with you. And uh, so, sorry, so humor me, bear with me, I have a microphone and a stage, right? So um, really what I want to share, I, I'm going to share with you what we found to be three core key philosophies, I guess I'll share, and, and what we've tried to figure out is how do, we, how do we all add value? How do you add, what's the value add you have for your families, for your clients, for the people that you interact with? And so we've come up with three that I want to share with you. Um, I'm going to share with you a quick formula that I'm going to give you a 48-hour over-under. Right? If you don't use this thing in the next 48 hours, you can call me up and cuss me out, whatever you want. You will use this in the next 48 hours, and then I'll tell you a story at the end um, that will hopefully be kind of cool and something to, to share perhaps with others. So first of all, three core values. What, what is the most important thing that we do? And the, the first one I want to share with you is a concept that, that we believe in. It's the idea of mastery versus expertise. Okay, so has anybody thought about the difference between mastery and expertise? Is there a difference? Right, so, so what value do you bring to your clients? And what I will submit to you is that um, expertise, experts are people that know more and more and more about less and less and less, right? So you are narrowing your knowledge and your, your awareness and your understanding of a thing where you're getting tighter and tighter knowledge around a specific subject. That's not a bad thing, by the way. That's a good thing. You want people that know lots and lots about specific topics and specific things because things have detail and you need to address the detail. The opposite of that is mastery. Right? Mastery is a broadening, a widening of understanding, and you, you see the oversight of everything, and you start understanding how things go together and how they integrate. What triggered this is I was actually at one of these events a while back, and there's a, a woman in this, in, I think she's out of Chicago, and she designs family offices for families. And so what I asked her was, who, what is the most important characteristic of a family office? Who's the most important person? What do you look for? What do you build around? And her response was a term that she came up with that, that I love using, and it's, it's a little bit oxymoronic, but she used the term the expert generalist, right? So what is an expert generalist? And so the way we've described it is, is a role that the family needs is somebody that understands that family, their fears, their dreams, their hopes, their desires better than any other person in any room they walk into, including their family reunion, right? Your job is to be an expert on who they are and where they want to go better than anybody else. Your second job is to be the second smartest person in the room on any other subject, right? So you need to understand them better than anybody, fears, dreams, hopes, aspirations, and you need to be the second smartest person on any other subject. Why? Because if you are overseeing everything that they have, you have to know that when you invest in the strategy over here and it affects, it's done in a, in a GDOT trust, and by the way, they've got an LLC over here that has a loan to the trust, and you've made an investment in this particular, in this particular entity, you have to know the impact that's had on that, on the real estate they own next door, on all the different pieces, how do they all fit together? Right? And so you have to understand enough to know that you've got to call the expert, whether it's tax, legal, whomever the expert is, you need to bring them and get them in the room in order to ensure that you have expertise on that particular subject, but you have to understand enough to understand how they all integrate together. And the other thing, if you're the second smartest person in the room, that means their attorney, their CPA, whoever it is that is the expert, hopefully knows more than you. Right? If you know more than the CPA, the person providing the, the specific tax advice, you might have the wrong CPA. Right? Because you can't know enough about all these different things. Right? So that's the concept of mastery. Now, when you have all these things, it brings in the second thing. Right? So the second thing is a term, and we use the word alignment. Right? And it's alignment. Are things aligned? And so how many of you have done a jigsaw puzzle? Okay. So if you've done a jigsaw puzzle, what's the most important piece of the puzzle? The corners, okay. So yeah, we'll get the corners, the edges, the, the last one, the one you can't find if you have kids, right? Um, so, so what's the most important thing? So what, what I've seen happen in most cases is, is families or people, and this isn't just in our industry, this is everywhere. When you go to get help, you bring this giant jigsaw puzzle, you dump all these pieces on the desk and you say help, right? Solve this, put this thing together, make it work. And our job is to find them and start putting pieces together. Well, what I found is there's people that are great experts at doing certain sections of the puzzle. People are great at doing the corners, the middle, the edges, the, the sky, whatever it is. They're really good at doing certain parts. They do their part. They get paid. Uh, the bad ones chop them up and make sure they fit. But eventually, they, they do a little piece of it. They give it back to the client. They pack it back in their box. They go to the next person. They take out the puzzle, set it down, dump all the pieces, and say, I got this section. Help. And so the next person does. And it, but the puzzle never gets done. Right? It's rare that the puzzle gets done. So here's my question for you. 
For those that have done jigsaw puzzles, have you ever done a puzzle without looking at the cover of the box? Right? Might it be more difficult? Probably, right? So what I would suggest is that the actual most important piece of the puzzle is the cover of the box. And what I've found is what's often missing is are we defining the cover of the box for the families that we're working with? Are we getting clear on where we're going? What are the outcomes? What are we trying to get to? Do we have absolute clarity on the cover of the box? If you don't have clarity of what's on the cover, how the heck are you putting pieces together? Right? How are you starting to figure out what goes to what if you don't know the, the outcome, where you're trying to get? So alignment is getting clarity of this outcome as well as being able to integrate all the strategies and know what are you measuring, right? We all measure results. Measure to what, right? It's easy to measure benchmarks and measure returns relative to benchmarks, but can you measure outcomes relative to expectations of lifestyle, of future, of goals, of dreams, of aspirations? Can you measure relative to what you've defined on the cover of that box, right? How are you measuring that correlation and is there alignment? Is there alignment of the values they've said is their lifestyle that they have and is your decision, your advice, your counsel based and aligned with they've defined of as most important to them? The third one I think is, um, it's an interesting one, a little bit less expected, but probably one of the most critical in an industry and perhaps one of the scariest when you really dig into it deep. The third one is what we would just call courage, right? Courage. And are there any people who read Jay Hughes? So if you read Jay Hughes, um, I mean, he's a philosopher, he's a third generation uh, attorney or maybe fifth generation attorney, but, but he is a brilliant man and he has devoted his life to trying to understand this issue of shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, right? We've mostly heard that by now. By the time wealth transfer third generation is blown, the money's gone, the kids all hate each other, right? We know that. And so what are those causes? Um, well, Jay has a concept, and he doesn't use the word courage, but he talks about a person that is, he, he calls, he uses the term the person de confiance, right? Which is the, the person of confidence. It's, the, it's kind of the consigliere, right, of the, of the family as a critical person. And what he describes is this commitment you have to truth, right? This to commitment to truth, even when it may not be in there, in the, something that they want to hear, right? And so you have a commitment to truth, to telling them what they need to know, even when you know they don't want to hear it and you know you don't want to say it. And you have to, in some cases, be willing to fall on the sword, and it might cost you a client because you have to tell them truth, right? So the way we balance this is our perspective on courage is it's a balance between truth and grace, right? So how do you, how do you balance those two things? Truth alone is a mean hammer, right? You can be truthful and be very ineffective even though you're being truthful. And it, you know, there's times when you have to figure out the truth you're telling and how you tell truth. And it can be a nasty hammer that beats on people and it does more damage than it does good, right? We've all been told things that might be truthful, but they're more damaging than helpful. The opposite of that is grace, right? Grace is the awareness of when it's right to, to forgive and to understand why things are the way they are. But grace by itself is really a pass to get abused, right? If all you have is grace, you know, you've all, we all, a lot of us have kids, right? If you have kids and you have grace only, then they'll walk all over you, right? They'll eat you up. If you never tell them what to do, you have them do what they want to do, when they want, how they want, then they're going to rule the house and you're toast, right? If all you have is truth and all you do is just beat on them with truth, 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 but have no grace to allow them to make mistakes and screw up, then you're going to have irritable kids, right? So do you have a balance of truth and of grace? So those are the three core things that we've found to be critical in adding value to our clients. A lot of people can manage money. A lot of people can do mathematics, right? But can you add value? Can you provide value around this concept of, of understanding the big picture, this, this concept of mastery, this concept of alignment, and this concept of courage? I'm not suggesting everybody has to do that because we're not all in the same business and we don't have the same focus, but I will suggest that it will make sense to be purposeful about defining which of those things you're committing to. Right, what are you committing to as the value you add? Fair? Second thing I want to share is a formula. And as I mentioned, I will give you 48 hours. That's your over under. You will find use for this. So I want you to think about this. What is the reason? What is the core common reason that will cause somebody to do business with or take advice from or connect with another person? What's the, if you were to boil it down to one word, who's got some ideas? Yeah. Trust. First guess, awesome, yes. So I, I think about a lot of stuff, right? I'm kind of a 
scientist, mad scientist. I, I ponder things, I think it through, I, I, and, and I went through this exercise. What is it that causes people to work with people? What causes people to take advice? And the conclusion I came to was it was trust. And so then you start, kind of, what is trust, right? So what is that? How do you know if you do or don't trust somebody? So think about somebody you don't trust for whatever reason, right? And I want you to think about why you don't trust that person. And can you define why you don't trust that person? What I found is when you try and define it, most people will say there's just something off, right? Something's just not right. It's a little bit out of whack. I don't know exactly. Eh, something's just off. I just don't trust that guy or that gal, right? But, but why, right? And is it valid? Trust is perception, right? There's some reality, but for the most part, our, our, our perception of trust is what we go into, right? So what makes people trust or not trust? So I started looking around and I found a very cool formula that we've screwed with and, and it's, it's probably not the exact same words that this guy came up with. So, um, but Charles Green is the guy that came up with it. And it's a, it's a formula and I don't have slides, so you, I, I encourage you, you, you might want to write this down. I'm telling you, believe me, you might want to write this down. And the formula is trust, T, right? And it's going to be, it's going to be a quotient. So you have a numerator and a denominator, right? So on the top, on the numerator, you have C plus R plus I, okay, divided by SO. C plus R plus I divided by SO. All right? So you probably want to know what those mean, right? T, you can probably guess that. It's a formula for trust, right? So T is trust. So any guesses on the C? Thank you. Credibility. Credibility is, is your knowledge, um, your, your awareness of the subject matter. Do you have the skill set, the mindset, the tool set to deliver what it is you're there to deliver? Do you have credibility? Right? So think about it in your business. How do you get credibility? Right? What are you doing within your business to earn credibility? If you want to earn trust, you have to earn credibility. So what are you doing to earn that? Right? And, and there's a whole formula for how you earn credibility. Right? It could be writing papers, it could be writing a book, it could be standing in front of a room speaking, whatever it is. How do you gain credibility in your business? And again, credibility is still perception. Right? There's perceived credibility. It doesn't necessarily mean you're super knowledgeable in that space, but people sure think you are and you have credibility in that space. The second one is R. Any guesses on R? Close. Reliability. So the R is reliability. Are you reliable? Do you do what you say you're going to do? Right? Do you follow through? And if you think about reliability, think about, again, and this comes up in the family a lot, where I see the, the trust breakdown. If you look at the issues of why family, why wealth falls apart in families in three generations, there's a, there's a formula for it. There's studies. And this study applies to a ton of different things. I'd talk about that if we had time. But, the, but think about trust in a family where, you know, somebody mentioned in the thing yesterday that, you know, the, the family usually didn't accumulate the wealth while dad was home playing catch with the kids. Right? So there, there's oftentimes this pattern of, you know, a, in most cases, it seems to be father saying, yeah, I'll be at your game, I'll be at your game, I'll be at your game. He's never at the game, he's never at the game, he's never at the game, right? And things stop happening and there start becoming this breakdown of you always said you would, but you never did, right? You bought me a nice car, but I just wanted to hang out with you, right? And so you have this breakdown because of what was said wasn't delivered. So think about it in your business, it's the same thing. When you stop delivering on what you say you're going to deliver, your, your reliability goes down, your trust goes down. So people that don't follow through, that aren't reliable, start losing trust. Okay? The third one, I. Probably a little trick here. Any guesses? Nope. Good guess. So that's more in the credibility. That's close. So, so I is a, is a term. It's intimacy. Intimacy. And so this is kind of like the do I like you. But it's a little more than do I like you. It's really do I get you. Do I get you? Do I understand you? Do we have a connection right beyond just you're nice or you're credible or you do what you say you're going to do? So this is an intimacy, which is in a sense is do we share values? Do we have something in common? Do I enjoy being around you? Do we have a connection? So I mentioned at the very beginning of this thing something that I was going to challenge people to do, and probably nobody paid any attention, but how do you create intimacy, right? And I will submit to you that you cannot create an environment of intimacy without vulnerability and transparency. If you don't have transparency, not just in your practice, but to some extent in your life, are you open, are you honest, are you vulnerable with people? Because if you think about people that you don't have int intimacy with, there's usually a lack of vulnerability, right? And the people you are most intimate with are vulnerable, right? And so there's this, this notion of, of you do business with people you like, right? Well, what do you like about people? Well, most common, there's, there's a vulnerability and a connection that takes place around intimacy. So, so far we've got the numerator, C plus R plus I, credibility, reliability, and intimacy, right? So let's look at the denominator. What's on the bottom? What detracts from your trust quotient? 
right? So SO was the frame, the term that I used. And again, a little trickier one, any guesses? So SO stands for self-orientation, right? Yep, thank you, selfishness. So are you motivated by what's best for you or by what's best for somebody else? Somebody with high self-orientation is motivated for self, right? Somebody with low self-orientation is motivated for others. So what are you, right? Again, back to the who do you trust or who do you not trust? If you think about somebody you don't trust, I will tell you, more often than not, this is the killer, right? Somebody that looks out for themselves, that looks out for number one, right? We have a whole, I mean, our, our system is built on look out for number one. Don't forget number one, right? And so, but the reality is that's a breakdown of trust, right? So self-orientation, what's their motivation? Who, who are they inclined to help? So now I want to think of how do you use this thing? Okay, so we've used it formulaically where we will use one through 10 on the top, one through five on the bottom, and run the math, right? What is the mathematical outcome of their trust quotient? And when you start doing the math, it's actually really fascinating because we've done this for other advisors, their other attorneys, CPAs, whomever might be in the room. We'll look at their trust quotient to understand to what extent they trust the other people. Because if you're designing something for a family and you think you're trusted and they trust somebody else and you're saying that person doesn't know what they're talking about and you think you're different and they trust them more, who's getting kicked out of the room? Right? You're done, right? So, so, so do you have trust? Do you, have you earned trust? And where does everybody else stand? Now here's the other interesting thing. The other thing I'll have to tell you we found is the, the outcome of the formula Right, you can, you know, 10 plus 10 plus four divided by six and whatever that ends up, the outcome of that number, the actual quotient is less important than, each in, than the analysis of each individual variable. And here's why. Has anybody ever had somebody walk up or come meet with you and they shared with you a, they did something. So I, I bought a new stock, I invested in a company. And you said, well, that's, shoot, that's what I do for a living. And why would you not have run that by me? And why did you do that? Who'd you take your advice from? Oh, my, my hairdresser told me. And now you're, what are you talking about? So you went and got your hair done, and as a result of getting your hair done, you took stock advice from that person. You've got to be kidding me. How does this happen? How could it be, right? And then you start thinking about it, and you run this through the trust formula. And you say, okay, well, this, this person doing your hair, so, so credibility, does she know what she's doing? Does she know what she's talking about? Well, no, not really. She's not credible in that space. It's not her area of knowledge and wisdom. Um, but so maybe she's a two or three in that space. But is she reliable? Well, yeah, she gave me one last month and it went straight up. It was awesome. She's an eight. All right, how about intimacy? Do you like her? She's awesome. She's great. We talk about our kids. We totally connect. She's the coolest person ever. How about self-orientation? So you were like a nine or a 10 on intimacy, right? So you had them up and all of a sudden you're at a 20 on the top, right? And now you go down to self-orientation. Well, is she doing this for, does she have something to gain? Is this in her best interest? Well, no, she has nothing to gain. She doesn't get paid. There's, there's no reason. She's just being awesome, right? So she's a one on self-orientation, like none. So you do the math and Oh my goodness, she's like a 20, right? That's amazing, this, this hairdresser's a 20, I just took her advice to go buy stock, right? Now take the flip to that. So here's another scenario. You go in and you've got an attorney on the team, right? And somebody's trying to decide, should this attorney be on the team or do we kick the attorney off the team? And we wanna know to what extent we trust the team. What, the attorney, well we do the math, low trust questions, this guy's like a four. Get him out of here. But then you stop and you think, well, why? Why is he a four? And you look and you look at credibility. So actually, this guy's really good at what he does, right? He's like, a, he's like an eight or nine on the credibility. He goes to court. This is a litigator. And we want him on this. He's, he's, he's good. I mean, this guy wins. He's, he's good. Is he reliable? Absolutely. He actually, he wins when he goes to court. He is that good. He's like a seven or eight on reliability. Well, what about intimacy? I can't stand the dude. This guy is a jerk. I mean, the way he talks to me, the way he treats people, he's brash, he's mean, I call him, he bills me. This guy's a jerk. I don't ever want to deal with him again. Well, he's like a one on that. Well, then how about self-orientation? Well, this guy's the most self-oriented, self-serving dude I've ever met in my life, right? He only looks out for himself. The only guy that gets paid at the end of this is that darn attorney. Awful. He's a five, right? So all of a sudden, do the math. You might have 10, 10, you know, two divided by five, and the next thing you know, this guy's like a three or four in the trust quotient. So you think you're gonna kick him off, but then you rethink and go, wait a second, if I walk into court, I might want that guy on my team. So here's how we're gonna handle that. This guy's high credibility and high reliability, low intimacy. So for the low intimacy, tell you what, you don't ever have to talk to this guy again in your life. We will handle all conversations with that attorney because you're right, he's a jerk, right? And we will take that. How about self-orientation? Well, the only way we're engaging this guy is if we have a shared mutual beneficial outcome. He's on contingency only, 
right? We are never going to pay this guy an hourly basis. He'll just bill us up the nose. So he is on contingency only. If he's on contingency, now all of a sudden, we've reframed this whole connection, and we've created an ally and positioned him in such a way that we now know, even though his net trust quotient might be low, he does belong on the team, right? So the application of this is interesting. Now think about it when you communicate with clients, right? Think about how you communicate in your marketing materials, in your white papers, and the things you're doing to connect with people. Are you creating credibility, right? Are you promoting reliability? Are you consistent in what you do and how you do it? And are you creating intimacy? Are you telling stories? I used to write a newsletter for our former firm, and I'd had it broken into a couple sections. Right, so we had the economic update, what's going on in the world and all the technical stuff. Right, then we had kind of something that was just a topic I would come up with that was something that was on my mind, philosophical, whatever the heck I was talking about. And then we had a last section, it was called galley chat. We had kind of a, a sailing nautical theme. And the galley chat was kind of what's going on with all the people in the firm, right? Who's, who's doing what, who's having kids, whatever it was. And so we could track openings, right? Who opens which section? And so what I found is we'd send out this, this newsletter. Most people actually open the newsletter, which was a good start. Um, economic, we had about, two to four percent read the economic technical stuff that we sent out, right? The article that was kind of broad or general stuff that was just on my mind, we had about a 20 to 24 percent open ratio on that article, which was okay. Galley chat, 85 percent opened, right? 85 percent, they didn't care about all the technical stuff that we think is really cool. They cared about what was going on in the lives of the people in our, in our firm. Right, so what does that tell you? That tells you we've got intimacy as a core value. Right, so trust, in my opinion, is the core fundamental way you will or won't be able to do business with people. It's a way that people will or won't take advice from you. So if you can be intentional about this trust quotient, if you understand that credibility, reliability, and intimacy divided by self-orientation has an outcome, and start thinking about ways you can be intentional about that. How do you accelerate it? There's a lot of ways to, imply it, to put that into, your, into practice. Okay, fun? Last thought, I'm gonna tell a little story. Um, and this is a very simple one. It's only because I've been asked this 25 times since I've been here. And everybody seems to ask us, where the heck did this name Achille come from? And so I'm gonna tell you a little bit of story. And, and the reason I'm telling you this is, is intentional because one of the things that I think is most critical about families staying connected for multiple generations is recognition of their family heritage. Right, where did they come from? Are you capturing the stories? A lot of times at these events, we'll do an opening where to get to know each other, we challenge people to introduce yourself differently. And you might do this even in your own practice and events that you do, and it's three parts. My name is, I come from a people who, and from them I learned. My name is, I come from a people who, and from them I learned. Right, so my story is an interesting one, and I'll, I'll share one of them, and it's, it's about the story of my grandmother, Dottie. So Grandma Dottie grew up in North Dakota. She was a farm girl, uh, the youngest of a lot of kids, and in, in North Dakota in those days, you had to go into town to go buy stuff. So her mom went into town and would always bring back gifts. Well, she brought back my grandmother when she was nine years old, a little set of porcelain baby elephants. And Grandma thought it was cool, and she told her mom, Mom, one day I'm gonna get a real live elephant. And she went through the majority of her life telling people, I'm gonna get a real live elephant. And she became known as Dort the Dreamer, Dottie the Dreamer, right? She was a dreamer, she was the elephant lady, and, and there was this constant theme that went with her, this person that's just got this crazy dream and she's nuts. And what ended up happening is she raised a family, they moved to Los Angeles area, they retired, they moved up to a little town in, in Northern California, just south of the Oregon border called Etna. And one day they were driving up into Oregon and stopped off at Wild, Wild Animal Park or Wildlife Safari, which is a, a game park up in Winston, Oregon, and went to visit the elephant trainer because that's all they ever did. And he happened to have just returned from a rescue mission from Africa and brought back nine orphaned baby elephants. And they had been orphaned because was, poaching was a big deal and their herd had been slaughtered and he brought home these nine baby elephants. And somehow in 1979, my grandmother brought home a baby elephant. And so she went from Dottie the dreamer to there's no dream too large you can't achieve. And she named, she had to come up with a name. They gave her four or five Swahili names to choose from. Akili was the only name that she could pronounce. And it meant smart and intelligent, so she thought it was appropriate. Right? And so she went with the name Akili. And so growing up, I spent all of my summers on grandma's place and, and working with the elephant and bailing hay and doing all these crazy things. We went on parades and we did a summer with the circus, um, all kinds of unique things that really shaped who I became. And you don't always realize the impact that stuff has on you. And the families you, you have have a story. Your families have a story and how the impact that's had on their life and why they think the way they do. So what are you doing to capture that story? Right? And so what we found is that if, if we talk about this Achille, this elephant, you know, I can speak on tax ramifications of hedge funds, and 
people don't necessarily remember that, right? So it's, it's be memorable or be unforgettable, right? We talked about that at the beginning. What do you have that's unforgettable? Do you have a story? Do you have a why you do what you do that's unforgettable? Right, so for us, this concept was intertwined in us, which is there's no dream too large you can't achieve. And there's a lot of families that need to hear that message. There's a lot of kids that need to hear that message because these kids, a lot of them have the capital resources to do what they want, but they have a massive identity crisis because they don't think they can ever become what grandpa was. Right? And how do you instill in them the confidence that they can do what they want to do? And are you doing that? So lastly, a quote, and this is a, a take action quote. What I'm hoping is throughout these last three days, you guys have made some good connections. I'm hoping that you've written down some new thoughts, and I'm hoping mostly that you have some action steps that you're gonna take when you walk out of this room, right? This is all a giant waste if you don't do something with what you just gained. We all go to conferences, you probably have 300 things written down, it's gonna go home, hopefully not sit on a shelf, and what is the action you're gonna take when you get home? So the last thing I'll share you is a quote, and it's from my grandfather, Ralph, that was Dottie's husband, Ralph, and uh, he was a, kind of an interesting character, he was a project guy. And uh, there was one point where my cousin and he and I were in his big dually truck, it was a giant truck, because you had to be able to pull an elephant with it, right? So it's a big truck. And we were driving across a bridge um, to get up to their cabin. And every, every winter it snowed, the bridge was covered with snow, and the thing was, we had to check it every year to make sure it was still safe. And so we drove to the bridge, we got out, we checked the bridge, there were three giant logs. He built it, he cut down the trees, he did all the work on it, and two of the logs were broken. And so I figured there's no way we're going across the bridge today. Well, Grandpa looked at it and said, I built that bridge. That log is perfectly strong. That could hold Achilles' trailer. We're going across the bridge. So I said, you go across the bridge. I'm out. So my cousin Gary and I got out, stood and watched as Grandpa pulled the dually across the bridge. As he approached it, he looked down the window, stuck his head out, and said a famous quote that's become part of our entire family heritage. And the words he yelled out out of the blue was, you'll never do it any younger. Right? You'll never do it any younger. He put the truck in gear and started driving across. And so that whole thought, you'll never do it any younger, really resonated. And at the time, I just thought he was nuts. But then over time, I started thinking about it and realizing, oh my gosh, Grandpa's right. You'll never do anything any younger. Right? There's nothing you can do where you, if you don't do it now, you're just going to be older tomorrow. Right? So do it now. So if you're not doing something out of this meeting, do it. Because you know why? Because you'll never do it any younger. Right? And so I'll tell you the story. The bridge collapsed. So Grandpa got halfway across, crackling, crunching, the thing starts falling down, right? So we're sitting here listening to things, and I'm seeing images of having to run back to town. This is a tiny town, population 300. There's one tow truck, one sheriff. I don't know who we need to talk to, but we have gotta go back and get this guy out of here. What's gonna happen? It starts collapsing, it, gets, it drops probably 10 to 12 feet and then just stops and hangs. And I have no idea to this day what held that thing up, but it hung there. Grandpa looked out the window, couldn't get out that side because it was dangling. Crawls across, opens the door of the truck, calmly walks off the, this is a World War II guy, right? He was the guy that stormed the hill. And walks off the bridge, looks at my cousin and I, checks out our shoes, and he had a big thing, always have a good hat, good gloves, and good shoes. He confirmed that we had the right shoes on and said, boys, we're jogging back to town, let's go get the tow truck. Matter of fact, that's what it was, very simple, we had to get a tow truck, a winch, pull the thing off, didn't end there, but what did echo was this concept, you'll never do it any younger. So my challenge to you, Take something, connect with people that you've been here with, figure out who you trust or don't trust and why, provide good value to the people that you serve, and do something with what you've gotten because you truly never will do any of this any younger. Thank you.